thousands of years, in camps and around campfires, history and stories have been told by Spokane Indians. Information handed down in the oral tradition from one generation to the next. This is the history of the Spokane tribe of Indians, a Native American group living on the plateau known today as Eastern Washington. Spokane ancestors lived in a land known for its waters and what was in it coming from the ocean. Rivers and streams once filled with fish, salmon and steelhead running so thick they filled the river. The area where Spokane's lived encompassed more than three million acres, where hunting, fishing, and gathering was a lifestyle, a pathway that led from one generation to the next. Starting around 1840, white men came from every direction. No longer were they here just for the riches found in hides and furs, but now they were coming to claim the land tribal families had lived for thousands of years. But at first, according to Charlie, a Spokane Indian who spoke at the 1887 Spokane Falls Council described the relationship between the Spokane tribe and the first whites that came. When the white people came to the country, we took care of them. They came here, some of them with only a little cup in their hand. Charlie, March 13th, 1887. Spokane families would begin to feel the pressures of the outside world closing in from all directions. To the north, in 1846, a line was drawn, not by two men, but by two countries, one from far across the ocean, the other, a new government, formed on this continent thousands of miles to the east by the white man's chief, the president. Many countries would fight for control over the land which the Spokanes lived, but it would be the United States and Great Britain who would divide the country down the 49th parallel. Unlike tribal belief, which understood, man was only a part of Mother Earth, being placed here to care for it. The new white governments believed land must be surveyed, divided, plowed, and conquered. In 1849 to the south, the California gold rush was on. Outsiders from all over the world came rushing in, traveling by ship across the oceans and overland by wagon. 300,000 gold seekers would invade tribes to the south. Word spread north to the Spokane that tribes in the lower country were being exterminated or removed. From the east, no longer did the Rocky Mountains hold back white movement. In 1850, Congress passed the Donation Act, giving every man 320 acres and, if married, 640 acres of land in the newly named Oregon Territory. In 1853, as Washington became a territory, President Pierce advanced a vigorous exploration policy. Isaac Stevens sought to be appointed as territorial governor, demanding he was the best person for the position. White intruders were being encouraged to take up land, even land already occupied by tribal families. Between 1850 and 1855, the white population of Washington Territory would grow from 1,000 to 5,000 white immigrant settlers. From the West, in 1853, the Cascade Mountains became the new Golden Gate. Gold, found in the Colville River and rich farmlands of the Columbia and Spokane River Valleys, excited many whites to enter Indian lands, even before the United States government could prepare the way. Thus, many whites headed over the Cascades to the Inland Plateau. And with no understanding between the two races and further complications arising as superintendent and Indian agent reports fell on the deaf ears of Congress, tension continued to grow. Thus, from the north, a barrier line was set. From the east, wagons full of people were coming. From the west, ships were bringing people that then crossed the Cascades. From the south, gold seekers and the military were coming. The Spokanes were in the center with immigrant intruders coming straight towards them from all sides. Anson Dart, Superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Oregon Territory, writing to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. I have been left almost alone to perform the duties and labors intended to have been divided amongst many efficient agents. In a region requiring at least one whole year to visit, 
As we were about to take up our march for Spokane County, an Indian arrived with letters informing me that I had been selected to make treaties with Indians west of the mountains. I deemed it advisable to return at once to Oregon City. Other issues, too, contributed to troubles on the Spokane horizon. American and British fur merchants were in the direct competition for riches found in furs and beaver pelts from the Columbia and Spokane River Valleys. Special Agent W.B. Gosnell would report. 1855, a Hudson's Bay pack train with a very large quantity of power, lead, and other supplies left Fort Nisqually for Fort Colville. I am informed by a white man who professed to be knowing to the fact that in passing through Klickitat country, the gentleman in charge of the train made presents of large quantities of ammunition to those Indians, openly encouraging them to take up arms against the Americans. Shortly afterwards, the murders of those citizens of this territory on their way to Fort Colville gold mines took place. Tribal people were not considered citizens until 1925. Thus, white laws in the mid-1800s treated tribal people without fairness or dignity. Indian commissioners would write of injustices. In the case where a white man attacked an Indian woman, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Oregon, Thomas Nelson, held that there is no way by which a white man can be punished for offenses committed against Indians, unless there be some other white person to testify as witness against him. Staying territorial law, a Negro, mulatto, or Indian shall not be witness in any court or in any case against a white person. The Indian woman laid beaten, the white man walked free. Fuel for a fire continued to build, and if ignited, a battle of enormous proportions would be started. All around Spokane country, bands and groups were gathering. Chiefs, headmen, and warriors were asking, are we to be involved? How will what is happening in the Yakima affect us here? Should we join as others go to war? Each chief, each man, would decide his future actions, what would be best for him and his family. Spokane chiefs acted independently in making decisions. At times, individual men, too, would act on their own, if they felt it necessary. Like any society, personalities of the warrior determined if calm and cool-headedness took place, or if impulsive, quick to strike was the action. From the winter of 1854 through the spring of 1856, Governor Stevens would set out to have treaty talks with the tribes in the Northwest. Treaties were signed, but many were contested, as feelings of those who did sign did not have the authority to do so. At the Walla Walla Council, Spokanes would attend, but did not speak out openly. Chief Gary and Gary's brother, Talilicum, were there among them. Stevens' first proposal for a reservation would include the Spokanes going on a reservation for the Walla Walla, Nez Perce, Umatilla, and Cayuse. At the Walla Walla Treaty Council, many warriors felt it was the opportune time to strike, to push out the trespassing white man. A plan was set, but the Nez Perce were split on whether to fight. War Chief Looking Glass, who arrived late as he was away fighting the Blackfoot, was against the treaty. Lawyer was all for it, and wanted to help the whites in any way possible. Many warriors felt what a better time to strike as 3,000 warriors were gathered. Other tribes were ready, a plan was discussed, but Lawyer of the Nez Perce refused and moved his people near the white encampment to protect Stevens. It would be the wording in the treaty that ultimately caused misunderstandings that helped ignite a war. In 1855, Governor Stevens was at the Blackfoot Council when the Yakima War broke out. The war quickly extended to the Ties, Deschutes, John Day's, Umatillas, Cayuse, Walla Walla, and Palouse. After the Blackfoot Council, he would cross the mountains and stop at Spokane Falls to have a treaty council with the Spokanes. This council would not go as quickly as others. Stevens would label them Stormy. Fearing harm would fall upon him as excitement from the Yakima War grew. Chief Gary spoke fluent English, thus extended the conversations, asking direct terms of Stevens, unlike tribes that required interpreters. Stevens would leave the Spokane without a treaty being signed, promising to return after the Yakima Wars. He asked the Spokanes not to enter the war. Stevens would never keep his promise. 
Today, the Spokane tribe is not a treaty tribe, not having off-reservation hunting and fishing rights commonly written into treaties. Chief Lot Whistlepusum of the Lower Spokanes in 1880 had Guy Hayner draft a letter accepting the boundaries of a reservation proposed to him earlier at a council at Spokane Falls. The original reservation was a bit bigger, extending farther north to the Oropakan Creek and then running east where Shimakan Creek begins. President Rutherford B. Hayes would establish the reservation in 1881 by executive order. War on the Plateau as gold-seeking miners ignored rules and trespassed on Indian lands and at times stealing Indian horses, Yakima warriors would retaliate and kill miners on their way to the Colville gold fields. Andrew Bolin, the Indian sub-agent at the Dalles, was sent to investigate. He too would be killed. Major Granville Haller would then be sent from Fort Dalles to the Yakima country to retaliate with 500 infantry troops and cannons. There, he encountered 800 to 1,500 Indians, led by Yakima Chief Kamayakan and Palouse Chief Auhai. Haller retreated. His defeat would inspire Northwest tribes to become bolder in fighting the Americans. Evidence shows, although the Spokane bands were not officially in the war, individuals were. Chief Lot's eldest son, Big Star, and a few of his band were there. Big Star had been friends with Moses, a Colville chief, and Qualchin, a Palouse chief. After the Yakima Indian Wars, unrest remained with the Spokanes. Fighting and skirmishes would continue in the lower country. Many Spokanes felt it was only a matter of time for they too would have to decide on how to handle military men marching through their country, carrying guns and pulling cannon as hostilities continued nearby. On May 31, 1856, Governor Isaac Stevens wrote to the Office of Superintendent of Indian Affairs that the five crows and other hostile Cayuses are in the Spokane, that Kamayakin has gone to the Palouse to beat up recruits. On July 18, 1856, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin F. Shaw, leading a troop of Washington volunteers, rode into a camp of women, children, and old men while they were at the root fields of the Grand Ronde and massacred all that he could find. Word of this quickly spread north to the Spokane. On May 17, 1857, William Craig, special agent to the Nez Perce, would write, There is no doubt but the Spokanes, or at least a part, have joined the war party. They are determined on fighting the Nez Perce, who beg and pray their big chief, the president, to send them some help. There is a cloud of Indians collected in the Spokane country. Tribes of the Upper Columbia have joined the war party. There are now Cayuse, Palouse, Spokane, Okanagan, Coeur d'Alene, and Colville Indians, a part of each of which tribes is now this side of the Spokane Prairie. A party came a few days ago, Spokanes and of other bands, to the number of 70, to the Red Wolf's country, and crossed from there to the Looking Glass, on their way to this place. They talked very saucy. They say they had come to get horses and join the war party. Similar councils were happening on the Coeur On July 1, 1857, Andrew Seltis, who would often sponsor annual gatherings, feeding the people from his herd of cattle, stood before his tribe and spoke. We know that bad treatment will ultimately force any tribe of Indians to take up arms. We also know that these valleys, plains, mountains, and streams are rightfully ours. God placed us here to guard them at all costs. We would never go out from our own land and claim another tribe's property. That would be wrong. That may not be wrong under the white man's law because he makes laws for the sake of money. Andrew Seltes, July 1, 1857. As snow began to fall, the winter of 1857 would temporarily reduce worries about soldiers entering Spokane country. Tribal ways would continue. Once again, coyote stories would be shared and history would continue to be passed on to the next generation. Storehouses and caches of salmon, steelhead, roots and berries were all full. It would be a good winter. As the spring of 1858 arrived, Spokane women would be busy packing up winter camp and moving to springtime root gathering grounds. <laughs> Who is Quentlus and 
One of these would be Seelil, near Cheney, Washington. These grounds were shared by Spokane and Coeur d'Alene alike. Men, after helping establish root camps, turned their duties towards the rivers. Salmon and steelhead would be returning from the ocean a thousand miles away. Fishing sites such as Little Falls of the Lower Spokane, Kettle Falls in the Colville and Lakes country, or Spokane Falls of the Upper Spokane were some of the most popular. Like every year, a council would be held of chiefs and leaders. This year, there would be added excitement. Scouts had just returned, telling of the news of the white military that was planning to move through their country. For the Spokanes, one such meeting place was Four Mounds, a site in between the Deep Creek Band, the Little Spokane Band, and the Little Falls Band, and the band on the Little Spokane. It is told a stone would be placed on each of these mounds representing a chief in attendance. Coeur d'Alene's too held such gatherings. This year, Andrew Seltis on May 14, 1858, would sponsor this annual event. At their council, Chief Vincent would insist on not letting the white soldiers cross their lands. Seltis argued to first meet them in friendship. At Sela, women and children had already been busy with full root gathering activity. It would be here that Spokane and Coeur d'Alene chiefs would come together for a council about the military that was headed towards their country. It would be Chief Scahalt of the Spokane and Chief Vincent of the Coeur d'Alene who would take the lead for the two tribes. But other chiefs too had their say in the discussions, possibly Seltis, Gary's brother, Palatkin, Enoch, Lewis, Antokin, Walshu, and Big Star, and many other leaders surely had input towards the discussion. Riders would be sent to the Palouse and Yakima camps to let them know of the decision. This had to be a war force headed onto their lands. The United States military had sent Colonel Edward J. Steptoe to help deal with the Indian issues in the Northwest. Steptoe, who was involved in the moving of the Cherokee from the east onto Oklahoma reservations, known as the Trail of Tears, Steptoe was involved in the Mexican-American War where the United States pushed the native peoples in the lower country off their lands and now call it Texas, Nevada, and California. Steptoe was sent to Vancouver, where he would quickly set out to build Fort Walla Walla. On May 2nd, Steptoe wrote to his commander at the Dells about his plans to take an expedition north to Fort Colville and attend to matters between miners and Indians. Also, Nez Perce scouts told the two white prospectors being killed on the Palouse River. In military reports, Steptoe's men didn't expect any trouble, though. As told later, in the drinking halls, Sergeant Edward Ball lessened the load of ammunition in exchange to carry more whiskey. On May 6, 1858, Colonel Steptoe set out with 152 soldiers, 7 officers, 40 mule skinners, and 200 pack horses and cattle, pulling two 12-pound cannons and two gun carts all led by Timothy and other Nez Perce scouts. Steptoe would begin his military march north, but instead of heading straight towards Fort Colville, Timothy convinced Steptoe to take a more easterly crossing at Red Wolves. This would take them onto Coeur d'Alene lands after crossing through the Palouse country. As soon as Spokane's and Coeur d'Alene's heard a military force was coming, scouts were sent to get news and view Steptoe's movement. What was he packing and how many men did he have? Additional news added to the unrest, though. Word came north that a survey group, too, was to cross the Spokane lands. Survey, a word that Spokanes were told was something that whites did before they stole your land. John Mullen was to lay a road from Walla Walla to Fort Benton. The Palouse, too, who had already spilled blood with the military, sent for recruits from their family on the Yakima. If it was a battle step toe wanted, war chiefs like Qualchin and Kamayakin were more than willing to oblige. Soon there would be nearly 200 Coeur d'Alene's, 150 Spokane's, and 175 Yakima and Palouse warriors. Others, still not in agreement to join the war party, were in the area, and others were on their way. Protocol for any group wanting to cross another tribe's land 
would send a forward scout seeking permission. Timothy must not have suggested this to Steptoe, possibly wanting Steptoe to do what they had been unable to do historically, defeat the tribes to the north. Steptoe's march after swinging northeasterly onto Coeur d'Alene land changed his route and turned northwesterly, which would be headed directly towards the Spokanes at Sela. In a letter written later by a military person of Steptoe's ranks, after passing into the Spokane country, we were informed by Indians that the Spokanes would resist our entrance into the country. On Sunday morning, the 16th, on leaving camp, we were told that the Spokanes had assembled and were ready to fight us. Not believing this, our march was continued until about 11 o'clock, when we found ourselves in the presence of 600 warriors in war costume. The command was halted for the purpose of having a talk, in which the Spokanes announced that they had heard we had gone out for the purpose of wiping them out. Steptoe, up until this point, assumed the tribes had helped them cross the river. On May 16th, Steptoe would be winding his way through the rolling hills of the Palouse. He would see that for the first time Spokane Chief Scahalt and Coeur d'Alene Chief Vincent on his line of path. On the skyline of the surrounding hills, warriors would begin to appear. Most prominently represented were the Spokanes, Coeur d'Alene's, Palouse, and Yakima. But unknowingly to Steptoe, they were all not there for a fight. That may account for the discrepancy between historians' 1,200 warriors and the true number of fighting men that engaged Steptoe, which was about 500. During the 1887 council between the Upper and Middle Spokanes and the Indian commissioners, Chief Antokin talked about the day. The white men were seen at the end of the prairie and I heard the Coeur d'Alene's were going to war with the whites. In the morning when the sun was way up, I got on my horse and went up there. They were surrounded by Indians already. I told my people not to shoot the white people. They told me they were going to make war with the white people. I went to a little hill, and that's where the Coeur d'Alene's were. I talked to the chief there, and I said, do not shoot the white people. And Salty said they were going to shoot them anyways. They wanted to drive them away and take their horses. He said the Kalispell Indians were on another hill. I went up there and asked the Indians there if they were going to make war with the whites. They said no. Steptoe would call up his flag bearers and begin riding towards Gahalt and Vincent. The springtime air was filled with horses crying out and warrior tones echoing down from the hills surrounding Steptoe's men. Were these two cultures at the crossroads of a battle? Vincent spoke first in Coeur d'Alene. Ah, stamas pu'us, chin Vincent, utstampuk tsukhui, tsukhast ulich. Then steptoe in English. Then they attempted in French. Realizing they would have to use the Nez Perce scouts as interpreters, Spokane's and Coeur d'Alene stiffened at this thought. How could an enemy be trusted to deliver messages of such importance? Vincent could only suspect they would twist his words. Steptoe would state, I'm Colonel Steptoe. We're marching to Fort Colville and ask the Spokane Indians to help us cross the Spokane River with canoes. Vincent replied, Tom Spokane, stool clear. Stichui stool clear. Stichui. Vincent pointed and questioned, Who stem next to Hui to Colville? Who stem to Steptoe? Chief Skahalt spoke up in Spokane Salish. When Steptoe repeated his request for help from the Spokanes to cross the river, Skahalt replied, more Indians would appear on the hilltops as they arrived. Among them was Kamaikan, the Yakima war chief. Steptoe's column of military dressed men were all packing rifles and pulling a howitzer cannon meant they were here for a fight. Steptoe's words did not match his actions. Vincent continued. <laughs> Steptoe would return to his men. We are turning around. We may have to fight. Prepare the men. Warriors grew more excited, some shouting out, encouraging a fight. The bugle was ordered to sound retreat. As they turned to the south, seeing warriors in their war attire, ready to fight, outnumbering the soldiers and no place to put up a defense, 
the column of soldiers turned and quickened their pace, marching back towards Koufax. Orders to the soldiers would be given not to fire first. Warriors charging and brandishing their courage as they rode toward the soldiers, yelling and shouting, challenging the soldier to take the first shot, coming within pistol range. When the column of blue colded soldiers, mounted on horseback, crossed a sheet of water, they found a small hill which they closed ranks. To one side, a rock cliff would be their protection. Here, Steptoe needed to make a decision. Return and possibly be labeled a coward, or to put up a fight which he could not win. Seeing Steptoe leave the main trail, take up a military position, war leaders would ride back to their respective groups of warriors, letting them know that there would be a fight. But first there would be another talk. Vincent and Skahalt would ride into Steptoe's camp. For many warriors, enough had already been proven a fight needed to take place. Warriors wanted to attack and wipe out the military, to send a message to all that wanted to kill their families and take their land. This discussion would be centered on the retreat terms. Vincent and Skahalt insisted on Steptoe leaving all his supplies. The chiefs gave it as the only option, unless Steptoe wanted a fight. But it was Sunday. Thus, for some who were taught by the priests on the Coeur d'Alene, fighting should be postponed. Surely a sleepless night for the soldiers. Steptoe and his men, discussing options and tactics, could see the campfires from tribal camps surrounding the hill that they lay. Spokane chiefs back in their camps would be talking with their warriors, banded around campfires, waiting for the morning light. In Steptoe's camp, dragoons prepared their 70 caliber musketoons and watched and listened to the tribal camps and the war cries and songs that echoed over the Palouse. The next morning, May 18th, 1858, a third talk was desired by Vincent, but this time he rode alone. But he found Steptoe's camp empty. Steptoe moved his men out before the early light. Father Josette galloped all the way from Cataldo, arriving at night in the Coeur d'Alene camp. He and Vincent would quickly ride to catch up to Steptoe to have one more talk. Steptoe, not wanting to stop, they talked while on horseback, moving quickly towards Koufax. More than one thing points towards the Nez Perce wanting to incite a battle. Having Steptoe cross at Red Wolf's rather than taking the direct trail to Fort Colville, not sending the scout forward to seek permission to enter Spokane or Coeur d'Alene country. But maybe the most direct action came as Nez Perce, possibly Timothy himself, with a horsewhip, struck Vincent across the face, shouting, Proud man, why do you not fire? Chief Vincent was a man of strong will and honor, so keeping with discussions amongst his tribe, and keeping with the words he had just spoken with Steptoe, that peace was a better idea on this occasion stated. Let us each return to his home. But there would be other bands and warriors, not satisfied with letting the soldiers go so easily. Collecting guns, horses, cannons, and supplies was still not enough. The soldiers were marching in military formation. On the horizon of the rolling hills, Spokane's, Coeur d'Alene's, Palouse, Yakima's, and a few other bands from the Columbia could be seen in the skylines, all keeping pace with the soldiers. At times, warriors charging in. Then, the first gunshot rang out, echoing up the ravines and across the open plains of the Palouse. War cries from warriors were called out. Military officers shouted their orders. The battles of 1858 had begun. Described by one of Steptoe's men in a letter later written, they rode bareback on their nimble ponies, naked bodies daubed with war paint, firing up on the dead run from behind their animals' necks. A running battle ensued. Charges of groups of warriors, each tribe independent of each other, attacking at different points in the military line. As the battle continued, Stepto would make it to a hilltop and set up defenses. Gunshots would continue. 
But luckily for Steptoe, the fighting didn't start until later in the day. As night fell, things would slow. Each side of the battle, warriors and military, would regroup in their respective strongholds. Everyone highly excited, talking about what had just happened and what was to come with the morning light. To remain where he was meant certain death for Steptoe and all of his men, surrounded by Spokane's, Coeur d'Alene's, Yakima's, and Palouse. As night fell, Steptoe and his men could see in the distance, all around them, campfires with warriors singing and shouting, chiefs and war leaders planning, sending riders out to communicate to the other bands on the other hilltops. But in the camp of the Coeur d'Alene, Father Josette would be conversing with Vincent, convincing him not to completely wipe out the military, as it would not be of any assistance. Vincent would side with Josette and send a message to Steptoe that a hole in an encircled battlefield would be split open to allow Steptoe's men to slip out through the darkness of night and under the drumbeats and songs of the Coeur d'Alene. Steptoe buried the dead and the cannons and under cover of darkness scurried out. As Steptoe left, he could not find the body of Sergeant Ball. It was told he was given orders to destroy the whiskey, but he had passed out under the bushes. Days later, as he made his way back underfoot to Walla Walla, he was given a hero's welcome. Thus, the complete annihilation of Steptoe and all of his men were not to be. Many courageous Spokane warriors fought to protect families and country, defending their way of life, fully charged with the exhilaration of battling with the white military. Later, it would be recorded in the annals of history, written by a soldier to his family. It will take a thousand men to go into the Spokane country. But that summer, for the Spokane, their first official battle against the intruding white military had been won.